The Shenmue games, and indeed the Dreamcast that spawned them, hold a special place in my heart. Even though I didn't know a lick of Japanese, in 1999 I imported a first print copy of the original Shenmue because, frankly, the magazines I'd seen it in made it look like the next great leap forward in gaming. A new way to play. A bold new genre invented by Yu Suzuki called Free Reactive Eyes Entertainment. Which, even looking back fondly, was a pretty silly and lofty acronym. The modern equivalent of Kojima trying to coin Action Strand Game, I guess you could say. Anyway, I played through my copy of Shenmue, and while I did want it to have more skull-cracking fights in it, and less asking people for what seemed like hours about sailors, yeah, I was absolutely entranced by it. Up until that point, we simply hadn't seen anything like Yu Suzuki's take on 1980s Yokosuka. Also, few games offered character models this lifelike, and even fewer games could boast an overworld this open and filled with just AI citizenry going about their daily lives. It was mind-blowing. And that's before you even factor in the sheer addictiveness of Shenmue's gacha catch em all toy collection. This is cool. Pugilism. Let's get sweaty. Mini games. Lucky dips for sweet prizes. And arcade perfect versions of Sega classics. I'll try it. Trust me, back in 1999 and then 2001, Shenmue and its follow-up offered some of the best gaming going. And I've got to tell you, having that franchise cut short by Sega's demise was a heartbreaking thing to watch for me. Sure, in the 20-year gap, Shenmue Die Hard's got a taste of some of its DNA in the Yakuza series, but that Dragon's Tail wasn't enough for purists like myself. It feels like a miracle for me to say it today, but after two decades, I've just finished Shenmue's Phoenix Resurrection in the form of the long-awaited, kick-started and then some sequel, entitled Shenmue 3. A game that I can wholeheartedly recommend right now for a purchase, at least for anybody who grew up with the first two. As for newcomers to the series, well, this is where things get complicated. Anybody approaching this as a modern gamer ought to be across a few things. The first thing, obviously, is that you need to get caught up with two games worth of ongoing revenge epic. Now the main menu has a pretty sweet recap movie that will go into greater detail than I can, but I figure I should give you some quick cliff notes as well. So here goes. Back in the mid 80s, our young Japanese hero, Ryo Hazuki, walks in on a tense showdown between his father and sensei, Iwao, and a mysterious Chinese gangster named Lan Di. After a brief fight, Lan Di murders your pops, gives you the business, and departs with an artifact that was secretly being hidden at the dojo. Long game short, Ryo begins a hero's journey to train up, to trace the whereabouts of Lundi back to China. Oh, and he kicks the shit out of 70 dudes in one go, spends way too much time and money on lucky dips, arcade machines, and forklift races. From here, we landed on the shores of Hong Kong, and Shenmue 2 began. In one of the biggest dick moves in the history of gaming, all of your acquired money from the first game got swiped in the opening minutes, and you fell down a rabbit hole of street urchins, more goons to punch, and you got some unexpected support from a cabal of kung fu masters who put you back on Lan Di's trail again. This in turn leads you to the walled city slums of Kowloon, and into the orbit of an opportunistic street punk named Ren. These unlikely allies are forced to form a jagged alliance in order to beat the local gang run by a festively plump gentleman. After much detective work, and the constant threat of falling into pure and utter gambling addiction with lucky hit games, it's revealed that this fellow is the sub-boss of Lan Di. Our hero then follows his nose into a more rural area of the country. And that's pretty much where we end up with Shenmue 3. In the closing moments of Shenmue 2, you're in the backcountry, finally making a connection with Shen Hua, this mysterious and beautiful poster girl of the franchise, who we barely even got to talk before Sega pulled the plug after Shenmue 2. She seems pretty certain that you are some sort of prophesied one from ancient text, a savior from a distant land. Anyway, after selecting one of four difficulty modes, which range from just give me a story to I'm a micromanaging masochist, you will be let loose in Bailu Village. Now relax, I'm not going to spoil too much more than that when it comes to the plot. I mean, basically, you're on this extended detective mission with Shenhua that starts in this decently sized rural area before going to a metropolis and beyond. That is just more sizable, populated, and in line with the town environments that we saw in the earlier games. I myself got through this on a respectable sort of difficulty, and it was a fairly sort of single-minded main plot run that took me around 32 hours-ish. That said, if you really wanted to chew on the side content, I, I imagine you could push that to 45+, plus, which is pretty decent. 
Now, Shenmue purists will know what the gameplay here is, because Suzuki has doggedly, and thankfully, stuck to the core of what a Shenmue game is. The nostalgia-holic in me couldn't be happier for this fact, because this entire thing feels like a game just stuck out of time, made for the fans with an absolute laser focus on pleasing them. And you gotta love that, because that's what we wanted. That said, and while I'm very much appeased, the fact is I kind of have to put aside my geeky love of this franchise and speak to the other half of the audience that may stumble in upon this. You know, curious modern gaming newcomers, because after all, it really needs to draw in new blood, new fans, and new money as well. So yeah, here's what you can expect if you're a modern gamer coming to this. First of all, Shenmue 3 is not open world in the way that you probably know. You're given a long leash, but time and time again it's yanked whenever you venture past an area where Ryo thinks he ought to be. To progress and to take those blinkers off, you'll need to check your journal for the next thing to find or ask about. And then it's time to just incessantly badger NPCs in not hugely interactive ways until somebody coughs up the next clue. Rinse, repeat. In this game, Ryo swaps his old obsession for asking about where sailors hang out to things like, have you seen Shen Hua's dad, or a man with a spider tattoo on his head, or are you an old person who knows more about this event and or thing? Mercifully, that's spiced up from time to time, because your quest will sort of be gated by a task. Be it a quaint sort of thing, like a hide-and-seek game, or a quick fight. I guess what I'm trying to tell you is this, Shenmue is a pleasant, low-gear game. That might be for your tastes, it might not. It was for me. You should also know that Shenmue is a lovely little time capsule in terms of visual and audio presentation. While it certainly is a step up over the Dreamcast days, and even the recent remasters that we got, you shouldn't go in expecting this to be on Yakuza levels of polish, which is probably Shenmue's closest modern analogue. Suzuki and his team smashed it on Kickstarter, but this is still considered a budget title and your expectations should be lowered as such. So definitely expect atrocious lip sync for the English dub that will either offend your eye at worst or at best feel quaint, like you're playing a dubbed 1970s kung fu flick. Excuse me. Hey there, lad. How about a game? Likewise, the English voice acting has been deliberately kept to the standard that it was 20 years ago. Corey Marshall returns to give authentically wooden and stilted deliveries of his lines. Most running conversations in the game will sound like the script was chopped up into sentences, thrown into a hat, drawn for the actors out at random, and then recorded in that order. Our hero also does the thing where he constantly repeats back what people have just said to him. Like, heaps. So, you can turn this into medicine, huh? And that's pretty much par for the course with everybody else who speaks in this game. And hey, both the obvious way to radically improve both the lip sync and the VO experience is to play this authentically in the provided Japanese dub with English subtitles. And quick disclaimer, I can totally see if some OG fans swear by the Corey route. It's authentic to the experience as they know it, and I wouldn't begrudge them for that preference. Personally, I was just indoctrinated by my Japanese copy back in the day. The heart wants what the heart wants. Moving on, it also has to be said that the character models in the game are very up and down in terms of quality. On the one hand, I can praise Suzuki for sensibly updating these old heroes and villains that we know and love, while also adding a tiny bit more emotional expression to them. Keyword tiny. That said, my god, every once in a while you will come across an NPC, not many, that has strayed into claymation caricature. Just dingo ugly. Newcomers should also be aware that Shenmue is something of a life sim. Things you do easily in most games have a bit of a chore mechanic attached to it here. Something we absolutely loved back in the day. Couldn't tell you why, we just did. Everything in here, including walking, running, standing, will drain your health meter. This can be improved via personal training, but training requires you energy binge with food, food costs money, money has to be earned doing jobs and or gambling, and that's your vicious cycle. It sounds weird to say it in a modern context, but I think OGs like me will love being chained to that wheel. But even the most rabid fans will lament the whole running kills your life aspect to this game. Bottom line, it just kills your curiosity for this world and your desire to explore and collect. But hey, like I said, you can improve it, though the solution that's offered is just swapping frustration with tedium. Also, you could say, yeah, there's a new jump system that fast travels you two spots or rendezvous that need to be done at a certain time of day, but that mechanic also takes a bite out of your ass as well. It's just, it's not ideal. 
But that's not to say there aren't some really cool modern creature comforts shoehorned in here. Those old entering door load times have been done away with, indoor and outdoor environments are now connected, you can zoom and manipulate the camera, thank god, and indoor environments are now overflowing with investigation points compared to what we got in the old days. This however is a double-edged sword, because being able to rifle through every drawer, cupboard, painting on the wall can just feel like this orgy of evidence at a few critical points in the main path. You're literally locked in place and asked to go rooting through like 30 or 4 interactive hotspots until you find X item for purpose Y. And hey, before I start sounding like a Luddite, let me tell you that the new combat system benefits greatly from some modern massaging. Admittedly, Virtual Fighter is in no danger of being dethroned today, but what we do have is this lovely 8-way run affair that offers manual or automatic selection of your special move combo techniques and a very wide variety of moves, if you're willing to put in the legwork in the overworld and find some more. I also really like the sparring mode that uses this sort of QTE style system to better train you to hammer out these combos. All in all, it's primitive when you compare it to what's around, but in the context of this franchise, it's a really great upgrade. Each area comes with training spots, ranked matches against increasingly difficult foes, and just random fisticuff moments thrown at you out in the overworld. If you thought Shenmue 1 and 2 were a little bit too pacifist, you'll be pleasantly surprised here. You even get the odd QTE moment here and there, just a lovely little throwback to the love-hate mechanic that Shenmue helped to bring to our medium way back in the day. I honestly think that if you give Shenmue 3 a few hours, you'll find your groove as it opens up to reveal its goodies. And I'm not talking about scintillating conversations with the beauty impaired. You'll want to exist in this world time and time again for the mini-games and the jobs and the collectible crap that they can provide, be it capsule toys or consumables to keep you in shape, skill books for sweet ass-kicking moves, or cosmetic options for a hero, like sneakers, shirts, jeans, and jackets. But why you'd ever want to change out of his default leather one is just beyond me. Look at it. That shit is timeless. There's just a ton of cool things to do in this game, but I'm not going to spoil them all here. I did however lose a bunch of hours getting my horse riding stance to stallion levels, honing my one inch punch to Bruce Lee ability, and just chopping wood to the manly sound of the afterburner theme. Likewise, there are more gambling opportunities here than Las Vegas. You've got pale toss, turtle racing, lucky hit dropping, weird four space roulette, and so many more things when the game expands out into the next regions. And so, at the end of the day, I think modern gamers may have a bit of a culture shock with how Shenmue 3 looks, sounds, and more importantly plays. That said, I honestly think it has a charm to it, a quaintness that will win over all but the hardest of hearts. Knowing all that, a gamer like myself, who never dared to dream that Yu Suzuki's long-form revenge epic could continue, that sort of person will be in heaven here. Shenmue 3 absolutely nails the tone of this, a franchise that was, and is, an important touchstone in gaming. I think this is a glorious homecoming, and I can only hope that it earns Suzuki a bigger budget and the opportunity to round off this ongoing epic. Give it a shot, because I can't wait for this to continue.